Hi everyone. Today I'm going to read you the beginning part to the first three chapters of the story The Hodge Hegg. I'm going to read the beginning, then I'm going to do another video for the middle and another for the end. So three chapters in each one. Um, this is particularly for A2 and A3 class because in your work pack you have a little bit about short stories and how to write short stories. But it's for everyone really and I hope you enjoy it. So here is The Hodge Hegg. Your Aunt Betty has copped it, said Pa Hedgehog to Ma. Oh no, cried Ma. Where? Just down the road, opposite the newsagents. Bad place to cross that. Everywhere's a bad place to cross nowadays, said Ma. The traffic's dreadful. And there's a picture of one of the hedgehogs. Do you realise, Pa, that's the third this year and all on my side of the family too? First there was Grandfather, then my second cousin once removed. And now poor Aunt Betty. There's a picture of the park opposite where they live. They were sitting in a flower bed at their home, the garden of number 5A of a row of semi-detached houses in a suburban street. On the other side of the road was a park, very popular with local hedgehogs on account of the good hunting it offered, as well as worms and slugs and snails, which they could find in their own gardens. There were special attractions in the park. Mice lived under the bandstand, feasting on the crumbs dropped from the listeners' sandwiches. Frogs dwelt in the lily pond, and in the ornamental gardens, grass snakes slithered through the shrubbery. So I'll just show you that picture one more time again. So there's the park. So they live in a garden where they have lots of things to eat, but the park's even better. There's even more food over there. And it's on the other side of the road. All these creatures were regarded as great delicacies by the hedgehogs and they could never resist the occasional night sport in the park. But to get to the park where their favourite food was, they had to cross the busy road. Poor old Aunt Betty, said Ma again. It's a hard life and that's flat. It's a hard death, said pa, pa sourly, and that's flat too. Talk about squashed. The poor old girl was shh, said Ma at the sound of approaching footsteps. Not in front of the children, as up trotted four small figures, exact miniatures of their parents, except that their spines were still greyish rather than brown. Three of them were little sows, so three of them were little girls, named by Ma, who was fond of flowers, peony, pansy and petunia. Pa had agreed reluctantly to these names, but had insisted upon his own choice for the fourth, a little boar, so a little boy pig. Boys, he said, needed noble sounding names, and the fourth youngster was therefore called Victor Maximilian St George, Max for short. Almost from the moment his eyes had opened, while his prickles were still soft and rubbery, Max had shown promise of being a bright boy, and by now his eyes, his ears and his wits were all as sharp as his spines. Now there's Max, it was a very long name, but they call him Max for short. What are you talking about, Ma? he said. Nothing, said Ma hastily. He wouldn't be talking about nothing, said Max. You wouldn't be talking about nothing, said Max. Well, there wouldn't be any point in talking. Don't be cheeky, said Pa, and mind your own business. Well, I suppose it is their business really, Pa, isn't it? Said Ma, or soon will be. They're bound to go out exploring outside our garden before long, and we must warn them. You're right, said Pa. Now then, you kids, just listen to me. And he proceeded to give his children a long lecture about the problems of road safety for hedgehogs. Max listened carefully, then he said, Do humans cross the road? I suppose so, said Pa. But don't they get killed? I don't think so, said Pa. Never seen one lying in the road, which I would have if they did. Well then, said Max, how do they get across the road safely? You tell me, son. You tell me, said Pa. I will, said Max. I will. Chapter 2. Max began his research the very next day. He slipped out of the garden at dusk, ambled along the path by the side wall of number 5A and crept under the front gate. There he is, creeping under the front gate. Immediately he found himself in a sea of noise. It was the evening rush hour and the homegoing traffic was at its heaviest. Cars and motorbikes, buses and lorries thundered past, terrifyingly close it seemed to him, as he crouched outside by the gate, and he was confused and dazzled by their lights. 
The street lamps too lit up the place like day, and Max, nocturnal by nature, made for the darkest spot he could find in the shadow of a tall litter bin, and crouched there with a hammering heart. Gradually he grew a little more accustomed to the din and the glare, and though he dared not move, began to observe the humans, for numbers of pedestrians passed close by him. So he was crouching where they couldn't see him and he was looking at all the people walking by. They were all walking on the narrow road on which he sat, a road raised above the level of the street itself by, by about the height of a hedgehog. They're safe, said Max to himself, because the noisy monsters aren't allowed up here. He looked across the street and could see that at the far side of it there were other humans also walking safely on a similar raised road. He did not, however, happen to see anyone cross the street. So he's quite a clever hedgehog because he's noticed that people stay on the pavement and that's what's keeping them safe from the cars. But they must cross somewhere, said Max. There must be a place further along the street. Part of him, for he was very young, said that he would find out about that another time and that it would be nice to creep back under the gate to his family. But then another part of him determined to set off to see if he could find this human crossing place. The street was on a slight slope, and perhaps, perhaps because of this, Max chose to go in the downhill direction. He moved very slowly, keeping close to the outer walls of the front gardens, where there was some shadow, and he froze, stock still, whenever a human passed. No one noticed him. Soon the houses gave way to a short row of shops, one of them, that very news agent opposite which his great aunt Betty had breathed her last, and here his progress was more difficult. The shops were still open and Max had to choose his moment to make a dash across each brightly lit entrance. Phew, this is tiring. Perhaps I should go back home, he said. But then suddenly, not far ahead, he saw what he was seeking. There were humans crossing the street. Sometimes by themselves, sometimes in twos and threes, sometimes in quite large groups. They stepped down from the narrow raised road and walked straight across the street with hardly a look to the left or the right and stepped up again on the far side and off they went. And every time that anyone wanted to cross, all the traffic stopped and waited respectfully until the way was clear again. And there's a picture of the humans crossing the road. I think you can see there what kind of crossing it is. This then was the magic place. Here humans could cross the road in perfect safety. If humans can, why not hedgehogs? Reasoned Max. But how do people know the exact spot? How do the cars and lorries know when to stop? Cautiously, he shuffled nearer, keeping close to the wall, until he found himself beside a tall checkered pole on top of which was a glowy, glowing orange globe. Across the street, he could see a similar pole, and between those two poles, the humans walked while the traffic waited. Biding his time until a moment when there was no one about, Max crept forward to the edge of the raised road and peered down at the surface of the street. It was striped. It was striped, black and white, all the way from one side to the other. This was the secret. It's very clever as he's discovered what zebra crossings are. Chapter three. By now it was quite late. The rush hour was over. The shops were shut. All was quiet. Oh, wait, thought Max. And then when a car or lorry comes across, I'll cross in front of it. Soon he saw something coming. It was a lorry. There's a lorry, it's quite a big one, isn't it? He was halfway across when he suddenly realised the lorry hadn't slowed up at all and was almost on top of him, blinding him with its brilliant lights, deafening him with its thunderous roar. It was not going to stop. Lorries only stop for people, not hedgehogs. The lorry driver, who, until he was almost upon the crossing, had been quite unaware of the tiny hedgehog did the only possible thing. With no time to break or swerve, he steered so as to straddle the little animal. So he steered so that the animal was in the middle between the two wheels. Looking back in his wing mirror, he saw that it was continuing on its way unhurt, and he grinned and drove on into the night. That's good, a kind lorry driver, wasn't he? The sheer horror of this great monster passing above with its huge wheels on either side of him threw Max into a blind panic and he made for the end of the crossing as fast as his legs would carry him. He did not see the cyclist silently pedalling along close to the curb, and the cyclist did not see him until the last moment. Feverishly, the man twisted his handlebars, and the front wheel of the bicycle suddenly wrenched round, caught Max on the, ba on the backside, 
and catapulted him headfirst into the face of the curbstone. So he got crashed into the curb. The next thing that Max recalled was crawling painfully under his own front gate. Front gate. Somehow, oh there he is, look, he's, he's gone a roly-poly because he's been hit by the bike and then he hits the curb. Somehow he had managed to come back over the zebra crossing. He had known nothing of the concern of the cyclist who had got off his bike, peered at what looked like a small dead hedgehog, sighed and pedalled sadly away. He remembered nothing of his journey home, wobbling daz dazedly along the now deserted pavement, guided only by his sense of smell. All he knew was that he had an awful headache. The family had crowded round him on his return, all talking at once. Where have you been all this time? said Ma. You right, son? asked Pa. Did you cross the road? they both said, and Peony, Pansy and Petunia echoed. Did you? Did you? Did you? For a while, Max did not reply. His thoughts were muddled, and when he did speak, his words were muddled too. I got a head on the bump, he said slowly. The family looked at one another. Something bopped me on the hittum, said Max, and then I headed my bang. My ache bads headly. But did you cross the road? cried his sisters. Yes, said Max wearily. I hound where the Fumans cross over, but... But the traffic only stopped if you're a human, interrupted Pa. Yes, said Max. Not if you're a hodgehead.